Alright, what is up guys? Today we are going to react to, let's see, History of Russia, the Rulik to Revolution. Alright, so this is a very major video. We're going to try and get into everything to do with Russian Revolution, which is like, how are you supposed to talk about that? It's very long, very complicated. But we're gonna try anyway. Oh my. For thousands of years, the lands known today as Russia and Ukraine were inhabited by nomadic tribes and mysterious Bronze Age cultures. The only record they left were their graves. In the great open grasslands of the south, the steppe, they buried their chieftains beneath huge mounds called kurgans. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus called these people Scythians. Their lands were overrun by the same nomadic warriors who brought down the Roman Empire. The land was then settled by Slavs. They shared some language and... So the Slavs, um, the Slavic people are very major to this because remember, they are the ones that are around all, mostly all around these areas, not, not really as much in the West, but they come to Russia and they kind of make the, how Russia is. Now it wasn't just Slavs, from the North they also came the Swedes, the Swedish Vikings with the Eastern Slavs made the Russians, which they would later also get captured by the Mongolians culture but were divided into many different tribes. Vikings from Scandinavia, known in the east as Varangians, rode up Russia's long rivers on daring raids and trading expeditions. According to legend, the East Slavs asked a Varangian chief named Rurik to be their prince and unite the tribes. He accepted and made his capital at Novgorod. His dynasty, the Rurikids, would rule Russia for 700 years. His people called themselves the Rus and gave their name to the land. Land of the Rus. Rurik's successor, Oleg, captured Kiev, making it the capital of a new state, Kievan Rus. A century later, seeking closer ties with the Byzantine Empire to the south. So you can see, like, it goes back pretty far. I mean, there's some that go even farther, like Germania, but this is areas that aren't really meant to, you know, go back that far, right? So Russia, this is very deep history, even with land that probably you wouldn't really be at, if you know what I mean. Just, it's still so massive that there's bound to be people there. Vladimir the Great adopted their religion and converted to Orthodox Christianity. He is still venerated today as the man who brought Christianity to Ukraine and Russia. Yaroslav the Wise codified laws and conquered new lands. His reign marked the golden age of Kievan Rus. It was amongst the most sophisticated and powerful states in Europe. But after Yaroslav's death, his sons fought amongst themselves. Kievan Rus disintegrated into a... Reminds me of the Frankens, uh, the Frankish Empire before, well, collapsed to the three states. Patchwork of feuding princedoms. Just as a deadly new threat emerged from the east. The Mongols under Genghis Khan had overrun much of Asia. Now they launched a great raid across the Caucasus Mountains and Whoa. defeated the Kievan princes at the Battle of the Kalka River. But then, withdrew. Fourteen years later, the Mongols returned. A gigantic army led by Batu Khan overran the land. The cities that resisted were burnt, their people slaughtered. I'm like, the distance, man, that is insane. That's like, probably went a thousand miles of distance. That's just insane, man. That, that I can never do. The city of Novgorod was spared That's because crazy. it submitted to the Mongols. Its prince, 
Alexander Nevsky then saved the city again, defeating the Teutonic Knights at the Battle of the Ice, fought above a frozen lake. He remains one of Russia's most revered heroes. The Mongols ruled the land as conquerors. Their new empire was called the Golden Horde, ruled by a Khan from his new capital at Sarai. Sarai. The Rus princes were his vassals. They were forced to pay tribute or suffer devastating reprisal raids. They called their... Republic of Novograd. Yeah, sure it's a republic. Oppressors, Tatars. They lived under the Tatar yoke. <laughs> Alexander Nevsky's Tatar son, Daniel, founded the Grand Principality of Moscow, which quickly grew in power. Under the great Uzbek Khan, the Tatars converted to Islam. A rising power the Remember, they're Eastern Orthodox. So now, this creates a big fight between the two. What if the Mongolians became East Orthodox, though? That'd be very interesting. Grand Duchy of Lithuania defeated the Tatars at the Battle of Blue Waters and conquered Kiev. Back when Lithuania was, well, packing in power. Eighteen years later, Dmitry Donskoy, Grand Prince of Moscow, also defeated the Tatars at the Great Battle of Kulikova Field. After years of infighting, the Golden Horde now began to disintegrate into rival Khanates. Constantinople, capital and last outpost of the once great Byzantine Empire, fell to the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Some hailed Moscow as the Third Rome, the seat of Orthodox Christian faith. Now Rome and Constantinople had fallen. Meanwhile, the Grand Princes of Moscow continued to expand their power, annexing Novgorod and forging the first Russian state. This becomes major because now they united the two. And this time, instead of Novgorod taking power, it's now the city of Moscow, where the new capital is and where all the new power is. Right? You see, like, how cities uh, do that. It starts with Novgorod and then Moscow and then St. Petersburg which becomes Leningrad, and then back to Moscow. At the Ugra River, Ivan III of Moscow faced down the Tatar army and forced it to retreat. Russia had finally cast off the Tatar yoke. Under Grand Prince Vasily III, Moscow continued to grow in size and power. His son, Ivan IV, was crowned the first Tsar of Russia. He would be remembered as Ivan the Terrible. Remember, this guy starts kind of the Russian Empire, sort of. It's not really declared as a full Russian Empire, but it's kind of the Russian Tsar. And this is very major because now, because like, this guy was the Terrible. This guy not only expanded Russia to such great heights, but he also was horrible in the ways he did it. With millions dead and massive amounts of invasions when it wasn't fully necessary. Ivan conquered Tatar lands in Kazan and Astrakhan, but was defeated in the Livonian War by Sweden and the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Ivan's modernizing reforms gave way to a reign of terror and mass executions fueled by his violent paranoia. Reminds me of someone else. Hmm. The trend happens a lot. You know, Stalin, Ivan, you know, I guess Hitler, but except he wasn't Russian, but you get my point. A lot of Russians tend to be like really paranoid. Russia well, was still vulnerable. Raiders from the Crimean Khanate were able to burn Moscow itself. But the next year, Russian forces routed the Tatars at Molody, just south of the city. Cossacks now lived on the open steppe, a lawless region between three warring states. They were skilled horsemen who lived freely and were often recruited by Russia and Poland to fight as mercenaries. Ivan the Terrible's own son, the Tsarevich, fell victim to one of his father's violent rages, bludgeoned to death with the royal scepter. 
the Cossack had... Very bloody. Adventurer Yermak Timofeyevich led the Russian conquest of Siberia. Now, why did they want Siberia? Well, it's because, well, they didn't want to be like any other nation where you can kind of see the other side. You can go to the other side very easily. It was for security reasons. They wanted to see how far they can go. What's the extent? What if there's another country that takes this land? What do we do? So even if it was very useless and trash land, he decided, you know what? We're just going to do it anyway for security reasons, which that probably was their smartest decision they could ever make. Defeating Tatars and subjugating indigenous tribes. In the north, Arkhangelsk was founded. For the time being, Russia's only seaport linking it to Western Europe, though it was icebound in winter. Ivan the Terrible was succeeded by his son, Fyodor I, who died childless. It was the end of the Rurikid dynasty. Ivan's advisor, Boris Godunov, became Tsar. But after him... And look, he looks like a, uh, a pope, kind of, for the Russia. So that means it's probably, like, it makes sense, the influence from East Orthodox. East Orthodox was the main religion of Russia, but this time it was kind of just growing. So I think it makes sense that, you know, someone like a pope would be a czar. <laughs> his sudden death, his widow and teenage son were brutally murdered. And the throne seized by an imposter claiming to be Ivan the Terrible's son. He too was soon murdered. Russia slid into anarchy, the so-called time of troubles. Rebels and foreign armies laid waste to the land, and the population was decimated by famine and plague. Polish troops occupied. Ugh, I, I have no idea what that era is. I'm guessing. That era is when they were just exposed to a lot of invasions and there was just a lot of rebellions. That's what I'm gonna assume. Occupied Moscow. Swedish troops seized Novgorod. The Russian state seemed on the verge of extinction. <sighs> Man, this, <laughs> this is so good. This is just an awesome thing to, to react to, honestly. And it's very good to, like, learn about. In 1612, Russia was in a state of anarchy. They called it the Time of Troubles. The people were terrorized by war, famine, and plague. Up to a third of them perished. Foreign troops occupied Moscow, Smolensk, and Novgorod. But then, Russia fought back. Prince Pozharsky and a merchant, Kuzma Minin, led the Russian militia to Moscow and threw out the Polish garrison. Since 2005, this event has been commemorated every 4th of November as Russian National Unity Day. It's so cool learning about Russia, honestly. Is it's a very interesting country. This country has been through like so much, and they've never really like they've been through fine, just not really that much, honestly, compared to the rest of the world. They're always going through something. They're always fighting. They're always pushing. They've been expanding always. They're always up to something. It's pretty. It's pretty cool. They're like a wild card. They're like Germany from World War II, except, you know, not so evil. I don't know which one's worse, though. Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. They were both pretty bad. The Russian Assembly, the Zemsky Sabor, realized the country had to unite behind a new ruler and elected a 16 year old okay also like how did the kingdom of sweden and poland Lithuania like how come they weren't able to conquer it uh, did they like expand a bit 
did I miss something? How weren't how 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 come they weren't able to just take it all? I think uh, the Russian population was probably relatively high, and I know like Sweden had a very low population in their area, and then Poland Lithuania was probably just not interested because it would cost too much. That's my assumption. Noble Mikhail Romanov as the next Tsar. His dynasty would rule Russia for the next 300 years. Tsar Mikhail exchanged territory for peace, winning Russia much needed breathing space. There, there it was. His son, Tsar Alexei, implemented a new legal code, the Sabornoya Ulugenia. It turned all Russian peasants, 80% of the population, into serfs, effectively slaves. <laughs> Their status in heaven. This is the funniest thing ever. You know why? So, you, if you were like, I don't know, France or Britain, you would enslave others, but not your own people. Russia is like one of the only countries that actually just instead enslave themselves. I'm, I'm just going to assume that most of them came from like, you know, outside of the actual people um, in Moscow or Nogo, like just around the actual Russian areas. I'm going to assume that most of them were much more everywhere else. But still, like, they enslaved themselves. <laughs> it, it's a bit funny. Inherited by their children and with no freedom to travel or choose their master. It was a system that dominated Russian rural life for the next 200 years. The head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Nikon, imposed religious reforms that split the church between reformers and old believers. It's a schism that continues to this day. Ukrainian Cossacks, rebelling against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, recognized Tsar Alexei as overlord in exchange for his military support. It led to the 13 years war between Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Russia emerged victorious. Re no surprise. Russia's been winning so many wars. Like, that's actually really impressive. Um, also, for the feudal system they had, basically. I mean, say what you want about it, but it was effective. W look at how Russia was able to conquer so effectively. Um, also, like, the population boom, like, because they had a massive population, they could just get so many, like, they could just get a large amount of troops, and then bam. I gotta see, like, a little chart that shows their growth in population, because that's, like, I think that will really show everything. You know, because if you have a low population like Sweden, you can't really afford to make invasions. It, they can't just invade Russia. It would be like, um, let's just assume... To get like, I don't know, a million troops. And a Russia can get like three or four million. And then bam, they they outnumber them four times. You know, one to four or something like that. Um, something like that. Russia's population and Russia's... I'm going to assume that they probably also had a very good military. I do know that the Russian military at this time wasn't really the most impressive. I'm not really familiar with this really, like, this era, 1650s. I know Russia does really pick it up in the, um, in the Tsar, you know, uh, Catherine the Great era. Claiming Smolensk and taking control of eastern Ukraine. A revolt against Tsarist government, led by a renegade Cossack, Stenkarazin, brought anarchy to southern Russia. It was finally suppressed. Razin was brought to Moscow and executed by quartering. The sickly but highly educated Fyodor III passed many reforms. He abolished Mesnichestva, the system that had awarded government posts according to nobility rather than merit, and symbolically burned the ancient books of rank. 
but Fyodor died aged just 19. His sister Sophia became princess regent, ruling on behalf of her younger brothers, the joint Tsars Ivan V and... The first Tsar is 1682. <laughs> well, um, the question is though, how come so, like, there was a lot of leaders that also tended to be female, like even for Russia, they had a, quite a number of female leaders, right? Why though? And how come, you know, we don't have a female president yet? Well, first off, the thing is that Christianity was probably a more pro-female approach. You know, we they weren't foot-binding women. <laughs> That's my point. And also family lines. Like, eventually you're going to get female by probability. And she's mostly kind of leading for Ivan the Fifth and Peter the First. Right? But also, like, and then if you look at, you know, voting and stuff, that we're just a little bit different in how the demographics work. Like, just, they tend to be less of a probability because, well, they're not really running. Hey, I think that's a good thing. Pol politics is stupid. Politicians are annoying. It's a good thing we don't have that many female politicians. They would hate it. Peter the First. After centuries of conflict, Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth signed a treaty of eternal peace. Eternal peace. Russia then joined the Holy League in its war against the Ottoman Empire. So okay, so this one, nah, real quick, real quick, I'm sorry, I keep pausing. This one's major, like absolutely major, because this is what starts... Russia's conflict with the Ottomans, this very long rivalry between the two. <laughs> it's gonna be so awesome, honestly, to watch how it plays out. How like the uh, Russians were able to defeat the the Ottomans so effectively. I'm pretty sure every war they fought, other than the Crimean War, was a Russian victory. Sophia's reign also saw the first treaty between Russia and China establishing the frontier between the two states. At age 17, Peter I seized power from his half-sister, Sophia. Peter became the first Russian ruler to travel abroad. He toured Europe with his grand embassy seeking allies for Russia's war against Turkey, and learning the latest developments in science and shipbuilding. Do we have Peter the Great? <laughs> Bro, Peter the Great, like, he's awesome. He's one of the best Russian leaders to ever exist. You need, you know, people like him. If there was a tier list, he would be asked to tier for, for the Russians. You know what? I'm going to do a tier list of Russian leaders. How does that sound? I'm going to do, like, Research on every single one, so that way there is no like the I'm not sure tier, you know, tier. You like that? We're gonna do that. The war against Turkey was successfully concluded by the Treaty of Constantinople. Russia gained Azov from Turkey's ally, the Crimean Khanate, and with it, a foothold on the Black Sea. Peter made many reforms seeking to turn Russia into a modern European state. He demanded Russian nobles dress and behave like Europeans. He made those who refused to shave pay a beard tax. Peter built the first Russian navy, reformed the army and government, and promoted industry, trade, and education. In the Great Northern War, Russia, Poland, Lithuania, and Denmark took on the dominant power in the Baltic, Sweden. The war began bad. Yeah, so you might think, well, Sweden doesn't have a chance. Their population's so low. Well, you would be right, but except the uh the leader they had he was actually a pretty decent leader not gonna lie he was able to conquer very very effectively but the problem was that 
you can have like an absolutely great leader if you don't have good resources and supply lines eventually you're gonna crumble i think the biggest thing definitely is the like i said population right and a good example is like napoleon he had a pretty decent population for france if he was leading i don't know a broken i don't know sweden if he was trying to lead sweden or you know finland or norway i know finland was in a country but like these two if you like led them or even denmark which are more well populated well probably he would most likely fail that's just kind of the reality but hey like still i think you can have a shot you just gotta be really really careful and you gotta do everything perfect one messed up and it's over russia was very very effective with it and that's why i think also religion helps because religion tends to help families and communities and family is what you need family units create massive populations i'm going basis of like i don't know heavily logic and no emotion with this part <laughs> Yeah, we only have family for war. And leave for Russia with a disastrous defeat to Charles XII of Sweden at Narva. But Russia won a second Battle of Narva before crushing Charles XII's army at the Battle of Poltava. On the Baltic coast, Peter completed construction of a new capital, St. Petersburg. The building of what would become Russia's second largest city among coastal marshes was a remarkable achievement. Though it cost the It looks so beautiful. Like not gonna lie, it looks so beautiful. The lives of many thousands of serfs. The Great Northern War ended with the Treaty of Neustadt. Russia's gains at Sweden's expense made it the new dominant Baltic power. Four years before his death, Peter was declared Peter the Great, father of his country, emperor of all the Russias. Oh, uh, so there was like more, there's four empresses? Interesting. Peter was succeeded by his wife, Catherine. Then his grandson, Peter II, who died of smallpox, aged just 14. Empress Anna Yanavna, daughter of Peter the Great's half-brother, Ivan V, was famed for her decadence and the influence of her German lover, Ernst Biron. During Anna's reign, Vitus Bering, a Danish explorer in Russian service, led the first expedition to chart the coast of Alaska. Yo, Alaska? That's pretty cool, not gonna lie. How were they able to do that, though? Like, remember, they don't have the technology. And do you know how horrible this ocean is like? It's so bad that it's like negative 40 and you get storms everywhere and... You just everything's bad everything's bad in this whole ocean i need to see like a whole analysis on how they were able to do this this was like an impossible thing that's why i probably would give her a higher tier list or like a higher ranking because like wow how do you do that he also discovered the aleutian islands and later gave his name to the sea that separates Russia and America. After Anna's death, her infant grandnephew Ivan VI was deposed by Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth. Why are all the dudes dying so young? I think it's like a biology thing too a bit. A lot of men tend to get like really sick sometimes. I think that's true. I'm not sure that's a fact. But I think men tend to get more sick because, like, they're doing more stuff, like, outside. They, like, that's what a lot of them tend to do, I think. I'm not really that sure, but something like that. 
Ivan VI spent his entire life in captivity. Until age 23, he was murdered by his guards during a failed rescue attempt. Elizabeth, meanwhile, was famed for her vanity, extravagance, and many young lovers. But she was also capable of decisive leadership. In alliance with France and Austria, Elizabeth led Russia into the Seven Years' War against Frederick the Great of Prussia. The Russian army inflicted a crushing defeat on Frederick at the Battle of Kunersdorf, but failed to exploit its victory. Meanwhile, in St. Petersburg, the Winter Palace was completed at vast expense. It would remain the monarch's official residence right up until the Russian Revolution of 1917. That does like a really, like, that looks like a really good palace, honestly. Peter III was Peter the Great's grandson by his elder daughter, Anna Petrovna, who died as a consequence of childbirth. Raised in Denmark, Peter spoke hardly any Russian and greatly admired Russia's enemy, Frederick the Great. <laughs> the irony, a Russian leader being German, yeah, this is um, pretty funny, honestly. I think next is Catherine the Great. So he had Russia swap sides in the Seven Years' War, saving yeah. Frederick from almost certain defeat. Peter's actions angered many army officers, and he'd always been despised by his German wife, Catherine. Together, they deposed Peter III, who died a week later. And it's also funny because she's German. A German fighting in uh, Germany. I, I don't know, it's just pretty funny to me. I guess like, you know, war sometimes you have to do that. There was no nationalism yet, so I kind of understand, honestly. In suspicious circumstances. His wait, wife wait a minute. Is Peter the third the first nationalist? Russia started the nationalist movement. Not Napoleon, not Latin America. It was Peter the <laughs> Third. I'm sorry. Hey, let's continue. Catherine became Empress of Russia. Her reign would be remembered as one of Russia's most glorious. In the early 1700s, Peter the Great's reforms put Russia on the path to becoming a great European power. But it was his grandson's German wife, Catherine, who deposed her husband to become Empress of Russia, who oversaw the completion of that transformation. Like Peter, she too would be remembered as the Great. Catherine was a student and admirer of the French Enlightenment, and even corresponded with the French philosopher Voltaire. She reigned as an enlightened autocrat. Her power was unchecked, but she pursued ideals of reason, tolerance, and progress. I would make a joke about being tolerant, but remember, it's like 1762, so like, I think I understand that we do need some tolerance at that time. Catherine became a great patron of the arts and learning. Schools and colleges were built. The Bolshoi Theater was founded, as well as the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts. While her own magnificent collection of artwork now forms the basis of the world-famous Hermitage Museum. Catherine encouraged I know, uh, listen, I really want to go there now. Like, why? Stupid video, like. Now I really want to go to Moscow. I really want to go to Russia just to see it. Or, I think this is in St. Petersburg. I want to go to St. Petersburg just so I can see this stuff. I know. I know, yeah, yeah you can, um. 
play me in the comments about Russia if you want. Or if you think it's good to go see St. Petersburg, you just tell me. Like, honestly, now I really want to check it out. Like, that's so cool to look at. Europeans to move to Russia to share their expertise and helped German migrants to settle in the Volga region, where they became known as Volga Germans. <laughs> Volger. The Volger German. I know it's the uh, Volga River, I think. Volga River. And they're Volga Germans, but it sounds like he was saying Volger Germans. And by the way, I'm pretty sure this is Stalingrad, so pretty cool. Their communities survived nearly 200 years, until on Stalin's orders, they were deported east at the start of World War II. Catherine's reign also saw enormous territorial expansion. In the south, Russia defeated the Ottoman Empire, winning new lands and the fortresses of Azov and Kerch. Are we surprised by that? Like, let's be honest, are we surprised by that? But then Catherine faced a major peasant revolt led by the renegade Cossack, Yemelian Pugachev. The rebels took many fortresses and towns and stormed the city of Kazan before they were finally defeated by the Russian army. Catherine then forcibly incorporated the Zaporozhian Cossacks into the Russian Empire and annexed the Crimean Khanate, a thorn in Russia's side for 300 years. Russia's new lands in the south were named Novorossiya, New Russia. Sparsely populated, they were settled by Russian colonists under the supervision of Prince Potemkin, Catherine's advisor and lover. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, exhausted by war and at the mercy of its neighbors, was carved up in a series of partitions with Russia taking the lion's share. Oh, I, I want to see that again. Like, look at that. That's already enough. Like, that's already a lot of land to start out with. In a series of partitions. With I look at all of that chunk stolen from Poland. Poor Poland. I feel so bad. Look at that. And then Prussia barely got anything. But I guess Prussia's, you know, the dangerous one of the group. And then Austria gained a lot. With Russia taking the lion's share. Like, yo, Russia's... That was so, so much land, bro. I don't know why they would allow that. Because, like, now, look how overpowered Russia got. But, you know what? If it helps them out, then, you know... I guess it's a good balance of power. Poland did not re-emerge as an independent nation until 1918. Russia inherited a large Jewish population from Poland, who Catherine decreed. And the reason why it has a large Jewish population is because Poland was the only one that tolerated them. And that's why, my friends, you need tolerance. Could live only in the so-called Pale of Settlement, and were excluded from most cities. In France, the French Revolution led to the execution of King Louis XVI. Catherine was horrified, and in the last years of her reign, completely turned her back on the liberal idealism of her youth. Three years later, Catherine died. She reminds you of a college student, going from, oh, we gotta be liberal, we gotta liberty, we always gotta be, you know, tolerant, and then she's now like, Mm, uh, uh, it's, it sounds really dumb now. <laughs> Except the tolerance of yeah, 1600. All right, guys, we gotta be tolerant in 1600. Ending one of the most glorious reigns in Russian history. She was succeeded by her son, Paul, a man obsessed by military discipline and detail and opposed to all his mother's works. Russia joined the coalition of European powers, fighting revolutionary France. Marshal Suvorov, one of Russia's greatest military commanders, won a series of victories against the French in northern Italy. But the one... Could it be? Could it really be? 
Napoleonic Wars. My war was a failure. Meanwhile, Paul's reforms had alienated Russia's army and nobility, and he was murdered in a palace coup. He was succeeded by his 23-year-old son, Alexander, who shared his grandmother Catherine's vision for a more modern Russian state. I thought he was the more, you know, like out of all the Russian leaders, I thought he was actually a pretty decent one. Though he lost a few battles, he was able, you know, to defeat Napoleon. So, you know, good on him. His advisor, the brilliant Count Mikhail Speransky, reformed administration and finance. Yet the emperor refused to back his plans for a liberal constitution. Ultimately, it was war with France that would dominate Alexander's reign. France had a new emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, who inflicted a series of defeats on Russia and her allies at Austerlitz, Eilau, and Friedland. I made a video about Austerlitz. Um, by the way, we're going to get into the second reason, or was it third? I don't know. Uh, second and third reason why Russia was so overpowered. Look at all that land. Oh my. Even if you took Moscow, if they're gonna fight for their life, like, you need to go all the way to, like, Kazan. <laughs> you gotta go all the way to, wherever this is called. I can't butch. But I don't want to butcher. In 1807, the two young emperors met and made an alliance. They kissed. That was, I think, like a Russian culture thing for greeting. Can't wait to go to Russia, <laughs> but not for the guys. Russia attacked Sweden, annexing Finland, which became an autonomous Grand Duchy within the Russian Empire. Oh, um, Finland, what made it so strategic is because, look at that, they've expanded their naval power by a large amount. You know, this whole area alone was probably their whole Baltic area, all, they like doubled all of that north. That's why I feel like Finland is just such a it's, a, it's a good resource to use. Because it's like, everything else up north is cold, you can't really live there much. But here, it's actually pretty decent. And since it's lower populated, like we went over, Russian colonists can go and make it the full Grand Duchy of Finland. By making it extremely Russian. And then bam, they don't want to rebel as much. Especially seeing how nationalism is going to come soon. But then, in 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia. At Borodino, French and Russian armies clashed in a gigantic battle. One of the bloodiest of the age. Napoleon emerged victorious. But the Russian army escaped intact. Napoleon occupied Moscow, which was destroyed by fire. And when Alexander refused to negotiate, the French army was forced to make a long retreat through the Russian winter and was annihilated. Napoleon had been dealt a mortal blow. And Russia, alongside Prussia, Austria, and Britain. By the way, I don't think the borders really looked like this. They looked a little more damaged, but, uh, whatever. Then led the fight back, which ended in the capture of Paris and Napoleon's abdication. At the Congress of Vienna, as part of the spoils of war, Alexander became King of Poland. Then, with Austria and Prussia... Honestly, I thought that was a pretty reasonable treaty because yeah Russia expansion's bad but remember like they went through all that pain they fought so hard you know and they didn't just throw numbers like what Stalin did they tried to do the best they can with with even with their large amount of 
soldiers, they still didn't just throw it. They were, like, careful enough, right? You can tell by, like, how they were very strategic. When Napoleon came in and burnt everything and heading back, they didn't just try and uh, continue fighting. They just let them do it, right? They let them burn it. And then walking back, they would just attack one by one and kind of pick their numbers off. Like, they were still very, very smart. Also, remember, like, they dealt with the cold. They, like, knew the terrain really well. When you go into someone else's homeland, they're going to know what their terrain is. You don't. Napoleon probably didn't have the best maps for Russia. He formed the Holy Alliance with the aim of preventing further revolutions in Europe. Meanwhile, in the Balkans and Caucasus, Russia had been waging intermittent wars against the Ottoman Empire, Persia, and local tribes. The frontier had been pushed south to incorporate Bessarabia, Circassia, Chechnya, and much of modern Georgia, Dagestan, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. But the peoples of the Caucasus bitterly resisted Russian rule. Russia's attempt to impose its authority on the region led to the Caucasian War, a brutal conflict fought amongst the mountains and forests that would drag on for nearly 50 years. Alexander was succeeded by his brother Nicholas, a conservative and reactionary. But parts of Russian society had now developed an appetite for European-style liberalism, including certain army officers who'd seen other ways of doing things during the Napoleonic Wars. They saw Nicholas as an obstacle, and the new emperor's first challenge would be military revolt. 1825. Victory over Napoleon had confirmed Russia's status as a world power. But there was discontent within Russia amongst intellectuals and army officers, some of whom had formed secret societies to plot the overthrow of Russia's autocratic system. When Emperor Alexander was succeeded, not as expected by his brother Constantine, but by a younger brother, Nicholas, one of these secret societies used the confusion to launch a military coup. But the Decemberist revolt, as it became known, was defeated by loyalist troops, and the ringleaders were hanged. Others were sent into internal exile in Siberia. This was to become a common sentence for criminals and political prisoners in Tsarist Russia. Nicholas went on to adopt an official doctrine of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. The state was to rest on the pillars of church, czar, and the Russian national spirit, a clear rejection of the values of European liberalism. Yeah, but most of the liberals were nationalistic, so the only one that he kind of embraced more was nationality. In the Caucasus, border clashes with Persia led to a war which ended in complete Russian victory. The Treaty of Turkmenchai forced Persia to cede all its territories in the region to Russia and pay a large indemnity. Russian support for Greece... And you also might think, well, what's the point of going all this way? The area there is just filled with mountains. It's not that useful. And, like, you're losing massive numbers. What's the purpose? Well, one is to show strength. They're trying to defeat their rival, the Ottomans. They got to take more and more and more. And second, they want more power over, well, the... the What was the name again? I forgot the sea. It, whatever it was called. The Dead Sea, I think. I, oh, no, the Dead Sea's around here. The point is, like, they... They wanted more control and naval power, and they thought this would be the best way. Also, it was it was sort of strategic. I mean, like, it's still a very long, like, like you could build a lot of ports. That's kind of my point. 
The more they conquered this terrain, the more they were able to build ports, and they would be closer to really good resources uh, around here. This stuff and this stuff, like, that's actually a pretty decent amount of land. And remember, this stuff's still Armenian, so that means that it's not like the the ethnic people in Ottoman Turkey are, like, gonna... It's, you know, it's not like they're gonna rebel. If they're conquered um, by, like, Russia, they're probably more likely just gonna be chill with it. Because remember, they... Armenia, like, there's no... <laughs> There's no better way to say it. Like, if Armenia is all united they're, and they get a nationalist movement, they're probably either going to just fully rebel or they might like their situation a bit because they're all united. They probably would still hate Russia, though. In its war of independence against the Ottomans led to war between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. Russian victory brought further gains in the Black Sea region. A Polish revolt led by young army officers, was crushed by Russian troops. Alexander Pushkin, Russia's greatest poet, was shot in a duel, and two days later, died from his wounds. Nicholas sent troops to help put down a Hungarian revolt against Austrian rule. The emperor's willingness to help suppress liberal revolts won him the nickname the gendarme, or policeman of Europe. Russia's first major railway was opened, connecting St. Petersburg and Moscow. Alexander Herzen, a leading intellectual critic of Russia's autocracy, emigrated to London, where he continued to call for reform in his homeland. He'd later be described as the father of Russian socialism. The Ottoman Empire, now known as the sick man of Europe, reacted to further Russian provocations by declaring war. The Russian Black Sea Fleet inflicted a crushing defeat on the Turks at the Battle of Sinope. But Britain and France, alarmed at Russia's southern expansion and potential control of Constantinople, I'll go a little bit quick on this. The reason why they want Constantinople is, well, they saw themselves as like the third realm for quite a while. And what they wanted to do was conquer it so they can kind of unite their whole idea of, well, the power of the East. You see, there used to be a Byzantine Empire. The Byzantines had major influence and charisma over, you know, Russia. And, well, the whole area tended to be very, you know, Slavic. It so happened that all the Slavics influenced Russia and... Russia wants all this land because they can unite their sovereign brother, brethren, and reunite the East Orthodox. That's kind of their plan. It did, honestly, that seems like actually a pretty crazy and ambitious idea. If they would, if they would have annexed all of this and Constantinople, though, not only would they be the most powerful country in Europe, like probably if all of them fought. If every single European country went to war with Russia while also conquering all this, most likely Russia may have still been the winner. Because remember, they haven't industrialized yet, so they, like, Russia still has a small advantage. I think it's more like 1870s when it becomes more of a problem. You know, they're industrializing, but they're not fully supremely industrialized yet Britain's still in that process France still in that process Germany's definitely still in that process uh, I don't think Austria is really industrialized yet and then Russia definitely has it the more eastern you go the more like the less industrialization declared war on Russia the Allies landed troops in Crimea and besieged the naval base of Sevastopol which fell after a grueling year-long siege. In the Baltic, British and French warships blockaded the Russian capital, St. Petersburg. Russia was forced to sign a humiliating peace, withdraw its forces from the Black Sea, and put on hold plans for further southern expansion. Alexander's the Liberator. Nicholas I was succeeded by his son, 
Alexander II. The Crimean War had So we get the Liberator, the Oppressor, and then we get just Nicholas. I, I believe that's the category. If you don't know what I mean, there was an oversimplified video about that. Exposed Russia's weakness. The country lagged far behind its European rivals in industry, infrastructure, and military power. So Alexander, unlike his father, decided to embrace reform. The most obvious sign of Russia's backwardness was serfdom. According to the 1857 census, more than a third of Russians were serfs, forced to work their master's land with few rights, restrictions on movement, Just and their sad. status passed down to their children. Sad. They were slaves in all but name. In 1861, Alexander II abolished serfdom in Russia. He was hailed as the liberator. But in reality, most former serfs remained trapped in servitude and poverty. Alexander's reforms would continue with the creation of the Zemtsva, provincial assemblies with authority over local affairs, including education and social welfare. In the Far East, Russia forced territorial concessions from a weakened China, leading to the founding of Vladivostok, Russia's major Pacific port. So now we're getting naval expansion in the Far, Far East. You saw first the Baltic, you know, when the first navy was established, then you saw on Crimea, and then there was a bit into the, I think like, black, um, the more of the Black Sea than just Crimea, and then now they're doing the east, a very far east. Another uprising by Poles and Lithuanians against Russian rule was once more crushed by the Russian army. In the Caucasus, Russia's long and brutal war against local tribes came to an end, with their leaders swearing oaths of loyalty to the Tsar. In Central Asia, the Russian Empire was gradually expanding southwards. Russian armies defeated the Emirate of Bukhara and the Khanate of Kiva, and by the 1880s, Russia had conquered most of what was then called Turkestan, Today, the countries of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. Imperial rivalry in Central Asia between Russia and Britain led to the Great Game, a 19th century version of the Cold War. Centered on Afghanistan, diplomats and spies on both sides tried to win local support, extend their own influence, and limit the expansion of their rival, while avoiding direct military confrontation. Russia decided to sell Alaska to America for $7.2 million. Many Americans thought it was a waste of money. Gold and oil were only discovered there much later. Oh my, that shit's insane. <laughs> Seven million dollars. So, that's around 120 million today. Alaska's worth four trillion. Oh my. Yeah, that was a very smart idea to, to own Alaska. And also, why did they sell it though? So, the reason why is that, well one, they could barely get over there. It would take so long, and it was extremely cold. Like, you would die probably before you would get to Alaska. So, it would most likely get conquered by Britain and Canada, right? So they thought, hey, why not sell it to the USA? Because at least we trust the USA more than we trust Britain. And also, I don't think many Americans would, like, really go to invade Russia. Canada might be able to have a better chance if they owned Alaska, however because, well, they're more connected to it. <laughs> Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace was published, still regarded as one of the world's greatest works of literature. I also read that book, at least the first, uh, maybe first or second chapters. The late 19th century was a cultural golden age for Russia, a period of literary greats and outstanding composers. 
Russia in support of nationalist revolts in the Balkans against Ottoman rule went to war with the Ottoman Empire once more. Russian troops crossed the Danube, then with Bulgarian help fought to secure the vital Shipka Pass. Then they launched a bloody five-month siege of Plevna in Bulgaria. Russia and her allies finally won victory, with their troops threatening Constantinople itself. But at the Congress of Berlin, Russia bowed to international pressure and accepted limited gains in a settlement that also led to independence for Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, and later Bulgaria. Meanwhile, within Russia, radical political groups were increasingly frustrated by Alexander II's limited reforms. There were several failed attempts to assassinate the emperor, but as he prepared to approve new constitutional reforms, he was killed in St. Petersburg by a bomb thrown by members of the People's Will, one of the world's first modern terrorist groups. This act of violence would lead only to a new era of repression. In 1881, Russian Emperor Alexander II was assassinated by left-wing terrorists in St. Petersburg. Today, the place where he was fatally wounded is marked by the magnificent Church of the Savior on spilled blood. Alexander II had been a reformer, hailed as the liberator for freeing Russia's serfs. But his son and successor, Alexander III, believed his father's reforms had unleashed dangerous forces within Russia that ultimately led to his death. Kind of ironic, usually the father is going to be a little more harsh, and then the son is usually the more like, when they're younger, more liberal. He tend, he's kind of the opposite. As emperor, he publicly vowed to reassert autocratic rule, declaring that, in the midst of our great grief, the voice of God orders us to undertake courageously the task of ruling with faith in the strength and rightness of autocratic power. The Tsar's secret police, the so-called Okranka, was ordered to infiltrate Russia's many revolutionary groups. Those found guilty of plotting against the government were hanged or sent into internal exile in Siberia. Alexander III was a pious man who supported the Orthodox Church and the assertion of a strong Russian national identity. Russia's Jews became victims of this policy. They'd already been targeted in murderous race riots known as pogroms after false, ru after false rumors were spread that they were responsible for the assassination of the emperor. Now, the government expelled 20,000 Jews from Moscow, and many who could began to leave the country. Over the next 40 years, around 2 million Jews would leave Russia, most bound for the USA. So, as you can see, we have a massive amount of them staying kind of around here, too. So, that's how you get a lot of the German populations, especially up north. And then you also notice that um, they're kind of going around here. A lot of them tended to stay in Europe, but most of them did go to the USA. These are the areas that are very important because, well, the Jews m migrating to Germany kind of shaped the whole, you know, Nazi ideology. But moving on. Concerned by the growing power of Germany, Russia signed an alliance with France, both sides promising military aid if the other was attacked. Sergei Vitter was appointed Russia's new Minister of Finance. His reforms helped to modernize the Russian economy and encourage foreign investment, particularly from its new ally, France. 
French loans helped Russia to develop its industry and infrastructure. Work began on the Trans-Siberian Railway. Completed in 1916, it remains the world's longest railway line, running 5,772 miles from Moscow. I, like, that's just insane. 6,000 miles. I remember going up to Missouri. I was like, maybe 700 miles at most. This is 6,000. And we're not even counting Warsaw. Look at the extent it goes. Like, that's just insane. To Vladivostok. Alexander III was succeeded by his son, Nicholas II. His coronation was marred by tragedy when 1,400 people were crying. The problem with Nicholas was he just, he was a mess. He got a bad card and he made it way worse than it could have been. <laughs> ...to death at an open air celebration in Moscow. China granted Russia the right to build a naval base at Port Arthur. When China faced a major revolt known as the Boxer Rebellion, Russia moved troops into Manchuria under the pretext of defending Port Arthur from the rebels. This brought Russia into conflict with Japan, who also had designs over Manchuria and Korea. The Japanese made a surprise attack on Port Arthur, then defeated the Russian army at the giant Battle of Mukden. Russia's Baltic fleet, meanwhile, had sailed halfway around the world to reach the Pacific, where it was immediately annihilated at the Battle of Tsushima. Russia was left with no option but to sign a humiliating peace, brokered by U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. What's funny is uh, Theodore Roosevelt, I think I've mentioned this before, he was like the only president that not only had a Nobel Peace Prize, but also like a, an award for like a Medal of Honor for war. So that's pretty funny. Uh, and then discussing Russia, well, yeah, it was very humiliating. They, <laughs> they had to go so far out. There could have been other ways that would have cut you know, cut it off by maybe almost a thousand miles. That would have seriously helped them, but they just kept on making mistakes. It, you you got to be very careful when you go into the naval, you know, naval, um, I don't know. Just when you go into your naval side of things, right, when you're trying to have control over the oceans, you got to be careful. First off, Russia's got to go through the Baltic, which means they might have to deal with, well, Britain, if they're, you know, entering through the northern um, the Northern Sea, and then if they're trying to get through Crimea, they got to deal with Constantinople and the Ottomans, who are probably, like, really hate Russia at the moment. And then, I guess their best chance is Vladivostok, but they just got that area, so it's like, you can't really build ships yet. Meanwhile, the Tsar faced another crisis, much closer to home. In St. Petersburg, a strike by steel workers had escalated, and plans were made for a mass demonstration. Tens of thousands of protesters marched to the Winter Palace to present a petition to the Tsar, asking for better workers' rights and more political freedom. But instead, troops opened fire on the crowds, killing more than 100. Bloody Sunday, as it became known, led to more strikes and unrest across the country. Here's the thing also, like, they were a pretty peaceful people. They weren't seeking this entire thing. They, were, they weren't seeking a rebellion or revolution. They were just wanting some change. Like, you gotta discern the difference between people who just want change and are, you know, pretty chill, and then crazy people like the Bolsheviks. The crew of the battleship Potemkin mutinied, killing their officers and taking control of the ship. To defuse the crisis, Nicholas II reluctantly issued the October Manifesto, drafted under the supervision of Sergei Vita. It promised an elected assembly and new political rights, including freedom of speech, 
and was welcomed by most moderates. Russia's first constitution was drafted the next year. For the first time, the Tsar would share power with an elected assembly, the State Duma, though the Tsar had the right to veto its legislation and dissolve it at any time. Sergei Vitter finally lost the Tsar's comfort. Yeah, so you have an assembly, but it can be destroyed any time by the autocrat who wants power. ...and was dismissed. The Tsar's new prime minister, Stolipin, introduced land reforms to help the peasants. While dealing severely with Russia's would-be revolutionaries, so much so that the hangman's noose got a new nickname. Stolipin's necktie. But having survived several attempts on his life, Stolipin was shot and killed by an assassin at the Kiev Opera House. Meanwhile, Grigory Rasputin, a Siberian faith healer, had joined the imperial family's inner circle, thanks to his unique ability to ease the suffering of the Tsar's hemophiliac son, Alexei. Yeah, so how he did it, though, was one, and this is mostly just kind of theory, but it's most likely what actually happened. Most likely, he probably got the medicines that, you know, like aspirin and stuff. It wasn't really helping out Lexi. And the other thing was he was able to calm his blood flow, so therefore, it wouldn't really just pop, right? It's really sad what happened to him. But, like, hey, like, at least Rasputin helped. Still, he looks really, really freaky in that picture. I don't want to stare at it. Despite sporadic acts of terrorism, Russia now had the fastest growing economy in Europe. Agricultural and industrial output were on the rise. Yeah, so at this time, they're massively industrializing. Like, they're boosting it through, they're working hard, they're going for it, and, like, no one realizes that. That they were doing absolutely amazing in the 1910s, the early at least. But then, they had to go to war which really, really hurt them. They, if they continued this whole process, most likely they would have been the next power, you know, to the level of the USA. Most ordinary Russians remained loyal to the Tsar and his family. Russia's future seemed bright. World War I. Why did he have to? In 1914, in Sarajevo, a Slav nationalist assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, sparking a European crisis. July. When Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, Emperor Nicholas ordered the Russian army to mobilize, to show his support. Okay, so not exactly, it wasn't just like Austria-Hungary declared war and invaded. What actually kind of happened was, they set out this really stupid treaty idea that basically gave Austria-Hungary all the power over Serbia. That was kind of it. Serbia was just really angry, and then they kind of fought against each other a bit. Not really like any military action. Austria-Hungary was mobilizing troops, and they were trying to get ready. Stupidly, though, and they just... They barely were able to do anything. They didn't try to um, like get their military up, and they didn't really do too much. And, well, what happened is, like, by the time the war started, they were unprepared, even though they were the ones that started this conflict with Serbia. Russia, the problem with Russia was they just got all mobilized and ready to invade, to defend Serbia, because, you know, Serbia is their Slavic uh, brethren. And then Germany comes in, it's like, hey, stop this. We need to chill out. If you declare war on Austria-Hungary, we have to declare war on you. Russia, if they would have just backed out and resorted to a new peace idea, you know, the more they stole, the more that Britain and France would probably intervene with Austria-Hungary. You know, they would have just stalled as much as possible, not tried to immobilize and invade. This war probably wouldn't have happened. And then why is mobilizing so dangerous? Well, because back then they believed in the idea where if you just invade, you essentially win. Right? I know, like, you know, um, it was Cult of the Offensive. As they, that was kind of the name of it. Basically, Germany and Austria-Hungary were afraid that if 
they were mobilized and all prepared and they weren't, they would just get invaded and then immediately destroyed. Which I guess is kind of correct. But th there's other things to it. And everyone just kind of freaked out. You gotta remember the kind of how it was at the time. And their, the belief systems and kind of the ideas they had. That's kind of why they did that. They did what they did. It wasn't just like, oh, logically speaking, they wouldn't have done that. Well, if you were in that situation, you had the same type of beliefs and ideas, you most likely would have done the same. Support for a fellow Slav nation. Austria, Hungary's ally, Germany, saw Russian mobilization as a threat and declared war. Europe's network of alliances came into effect, and soon all the major powers were marching to war. World War I had begun. World War I. Russia experienced a wave of patriotic fervor. The capital, St. Petersburg, was even renamed Petrograd to sound less German. An early Russian advance into East Prussia ended with heavy defeats at Tannenberg and Ooh. the Masurian Lakes. There was greater success against Austria-Hungary, but that too came at a high price. Russian losses forced the army to make a general retreat in 1915. In 1916, Russia's Brusilov offensive against Austro-Hungarian forces was one of the most successful Allied attacks of the war. Yeah, but you have to remember, Austro-Hungary isn't really that developed. <laughs> They're kind of like the crippled brother of Germany. They, they just are kind of really, really backwards. But losses were so heavy that the Russian army was unable to launch any more major operations. In Petrograd, Rasputin, whose alleged influence over the Tsar's family was despised by certain Russian aristocrats, was murdered, possibly with the help of British agents. The war put intolerable strains on Russia. At the front, losses were enormous, while in the cities, economic mismanagement led to rising prices and food shortages. In Petrograd, the workers' frustration led to strikes and demonstrations. Troops ordered to disperse the crowds refused and joined the protesters instead. The government had lost control of the capital. On board the imperial train at Puskov, senior politicians and generals told the emperor he must abdicate, or Russia would descend into anarchy and lose the war. Nicholas accepted their advice. Um, why does Lenin look like that? Or like, why is he... I don't know. It kind of freaked... It, it just looks kind of weird doing that. It's like... I don't know. Anyways, yeah, so the, he was on a train way, I believe, because Nicholas, like, went into the war to try and help out morale, which I guess, kind idea, but still, you gotta lead your nation, don't be stupid. And as he was heading back to Petrograd, but it's St. Petersburg, by the way, well, while he was heading back to Petrograd, he was stopped by, well, the, I believe the Bolsheviks, and then they kind of got him to abdicate. And that's kind of what happened. Ice ...and renounced the throne in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Michael, who effectively declined the offer. For... Bruh, my middle name is Michael. ...hundred years of Romanov rule were at an end. Russia was now a republic. No! A provisional... No, no! A republic! We have to have voting? Oh, that's gross. Oh, no. The government took power, but could not halt Russia's slide into economic and military chaos. Workers, soldiers, and peasants elected their own councils, known as Soviets. The Petrograd Soviet was so powerful, it was effectively a rival government, especially as discontent with the provisional government 
continued to grow. The Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin attracted growing support with their radical proposals for an immediate end to the war, the redistribution of land, and transfer of power to the Soviets. In October, they launched a coup, masterminded by Leon Trotsky. Shockingly, Trotsky actually was pretty good in military. Like that, that this certainly did surprise me. Other than, you know, the entire failure of like, um, no, no war, no peace, where they kind of just let Germany take even more land. Now, not gonna lie, that was kind of funny. Bolshevik Red Guards stormed the Winter Palace, where the provisional government met, and arrested its members. Lenin and the Bolsheviks were now in charge. How did that happen, though? Well, real quickly to explain it. So, the provisional government was worried about, you know, czarist Russia ideas and military, you know, um, taking over and then basically establishing power. So they kind of wanted the provisional, or not, sorry, not provisional. They wanted, you know, Lenin and his, you know, Bolsheviks to try and, well, defeat, defeat them, right? So they gave them guns, weapons, everything. Before, they were stealing, murdering, and burning things, but they were given everything. And then, well, the Bolsheviks saw that they had weapons, they had everything, and the provisional government was kind of a mess right now. So they thought, hey... Let's take them over. <laughs> you know, the provisional government never, you know, gave them the resources. We wouldn't have seen this communist uh, revolution. Russia had been thrown upon a bold and dangerous course. Under a Marxist-inspired revolutionary party, it would now seek to create the world's first communist state. But first, it would have to survive the chaos and slaughter of one of history's bloodiest civil wars. Thank all you right. To all our this video honestly was pretty good. I had, a, I had a great time watching it. And sorry if I was gone for a while. I was in Missouri for a trip. I can explain it another time if you're really interested. But yeah, um, I guess I'll just end the video from here. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon.